once again thank you very much for your kind invitation thank you very much for spending this time on a saturday evening with me my conflicts of interest i'm consultant for these four companies but i don't think it's really relevant for this talk the Ankenta. i'm going to speak about the current role of spinal cord simulation in the interventional pain management how we got to the new systems that we have nowadays why i think that a new era has begun in this field and i'm going to say some things about the future of the therapy let's start with the current role of spinal cord stimulation. I don't know if you can hear the sound. Please let me know. Unfortunately, no. You cannot hear the sound. I was afraid about that. But I can tell you, for this slide, it's not really important. You see here the train. The train is the patient with chronic pain. The man here is a physician who is trying to remove all obstacles so that the patient can, has, can have a less uh, pain. This is what we do in everyday life. We always try to help our chronic pain patients. We are trying to remove all obstacles from their way. Sometimes it works really well. Sometimes it doesn't work so well, but at least we try. I'm coming from Greece. I must mention something about Heraclitus. Heraclitus once wrote, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and he's not the same Man, here you can see not a river, but a sea. This is these are two videos coming from Icaria, a small island. I took these videos with a difference of two or three minutes. You see, the waves are completely different, and this is the same with pain. Every day the pain is different, and we should never forget about it. About it. A provocative question: What it's like to be a bat? What what is like to be? a microhiropteron. This was the title of an article. It was published when you were probably not bo uh, born in 1974. This was the title of this article. It was published in this philosophical review. And the author wrote these experiences, for example, pain or hunger, also have in its case a specific subjective character which is beyond our ability to conceive. And this is the problem of chronic pain. It's really subjective. But also, we should not forget, we don't really know what it's like not being able to hear if somebody is deaf, what it's like not being able to see if someone is blind. This is also pretty subjective. And then we have other practical problems. This is a part of a questionnaire, pain detect questionnaire. It's a questionnaire we're using in order to see if the pain is neuropathic, the German version of it. And here you see the patient should tell us how severe is the pain on this scale from 0 to 10. And you see the patient, it was a woman, wrote these numbers there. It took us a few seconds to understand that it was her mobile number, not her pain. You may laugh, but this is something we see in everyday life and makes our uh, work pretty difficult. So we have chronic pain, there are different treatments of chronic pain. One of these treatments is this one, I found it on, on Instagram, maybe you have already seen it. But thanks God we have also some more scientific things. We have interventional pain therapy. And with all these therapies, with all neuromodulation approaches, we can act at the level of the first neuron, we can act at the level of the second neuron, and we can act at the level of the third neuron. Spinal cord simulation, together with the intratecal therapy with or without opioids, are belonging to the second category. We are influencing, we are modulating the second neuron. This is, for me, the most important slide of this presentation. Which patients could be good candidates for spinal cord stimulation? And just to be sure that we are all speaking the same language here, spinal cord stimulation is the implantation of one or two leads in the spinal canal epidurally then we have a trial we are giving electrical impulses with different types of stimulation and if the patient is satisfied or if the patient has a pain relief of at least 50 percent then we connect this lead or these leads to a permanent battery to a neurostimulator okay this is spinal cord stimulation, leads in the spinal canal, and we should connect these leads to a permanent battery. 
which are the good candidates for this therapy. Patients with transgeminal neuropathy, please be careful, not neuralgia. We are not talking about attacks. We are talking about a permanent burning pain in the face. This is transgeminal neuropathy, 24 hours per day. The majority of patients who are coming to us are patients with this failed back surgery syndrome or the new term persistent spinal pain syndrome are patients who have been operated on different parts of the spine, cervical spine, thoracic spine, lumbar spine, and they still have problems, back problems, back pain, neck pain, arm pain, leg pain, combination of these pains. Patients after amputation with phantom pain or stump pain, patients with polyneuropathies, for example, patients with diabetes mellitus, or patients after uh, chemotherapy, tumor patients, patients with plexus lesions. My best patients are patients with angina pectoris or peripheral vascular disease, patients with postherpetic neuralgia, and patients with this complex regional pain syndrome with type 1 or without capsalgia. As a student, I never read anything about this CRPS or Morbus Sudek is another name, complex regional pain syndrome. Please make a notice and if you already know about it, please have a look in the internet. Once again, as a medical student, as a resident, I never learned about it. Do you know who is this guy here? I'm going to help you a little bit. His face is on these notes of $100, Benjamin Franklin. He was many things. He was a polymath, he was a scientist, he was an inventor, a philosopher, a diplomat, but his big passion was writing. He wanted to become a very good writer. So what did he do? He took The Spectator, it was the most prestigious journal or magazine of his time. He chose an article, he read it, he took notes about this article, and some weeks later he used his own notes to write his own version of this article. And he did it all over again with many, many articles. And in the end, after many years, he realized that what he wrote, his own version, was much better than the original article he once read. So he kept evolving. And this is the goal for all scientists, for all physicians, and for spinal cord stimulation as a therapy. We should keep evolving. It is true that now we have a paradigm shift. This is an interesting article from Dr. Slavin Maguire, published in AMA Journal of Ethics. And the colleagues here are describing that we have a tendency or a paradigm shift to move away from the World Health Organization analgesic ladder toward an earlier surgical intervention. And this has implications for the patients, for their families, and for the society. This is the World Health Organization ladder on the right part of the screen. We should start with non-opioids, then we should go to the weak opioids, then to the strong opioids. If all these things don't help, we have the intratecal therapy with opioids or without opioids. This is the traditional ladder. But we have seen that if we start with our neuromodulation options, for example, pulse radiofrequency, or peripheral nerve stimulation, or peripheral nerve field stimulation, or spinal cord stimulation, before even starting using the weak opioids, then the clinical results are better. Unfortunately, the colleagues who uh, established this ladder back then were anesthesiologists, and they didn't have any experience with neuromodulation. And this is why now we are trying to influence things and try to incorporate neuromodulation in this ladder. Spinal cord stimulation, it's not a new therapy. Everything started with this article published in Science in 1965. It's the famous gate control theory from Dr. Melzak and Dr. Wall. And actually the colleagues said back then that if we activate the large diameters, alpha, beta fibers, then we block the transmission of pain to the brain, 1965. The first clinical application of the therapy, 1967, in a patient with a lung cancer and pain, his daughter was an uh, 
anesthesiology nurse, convinced her father to undergo the surgery. The colleagues implanted on March uh, 24th a lead. The patient was satisfied, achieved a, some, a significant pain relief, but unfortunately, six days after the surgery, he died because of endocarditis. Once again, 1967, not a new therapy. And even though it's not a new therapy, we don't really know how it works. It uh, sounds funny, but this is the truth. We know that we implant these leads in the spinal canal, dorsally. We know that we stimulate the dorsal columns and the dorsal horns. We know that we have segmental spinal effects at the level of the spinal cord. And we know that there are also descending inhibitory pathways. There are many publications with humans, with uh, rats, with uh, mice, that are showing different mechanisms of action, but we don't really know 100% how this therapy works. This is the history of neuromodulation here in Germany, although I'm coming from Greece. This was the first spinal cord stimulation meeting here in Germany, in a city called Freiburg, in the southern part of Germany. And the devices you see here are receivers, radio frequency receivers. There is no battery here. The colleagues back then implanted these devices under the skin. And each time the patient wanted to stimulate, uh, he had to place this antenna over the receiver. It was a little bit complicated, but these were the first steps of the therapy. Interestingly, the colleagues back then started working with leads with only one conduct, and the patients were satisfied. Then we had leads with two conducts, with four, with eight, and today we have leads with up to 32 conducts. We have the percutaneous leads on the left part of the screen, they are simple leads, and we have the surgical or paddle leads on the right side of the screen. So the options are really much more now. And this is what we see if we are using fluoroscopy or an X-ray after the operation. We can implant one lead with eight codecs, or we can implant two leads with eight codecs. We can implant one or two leads with 16 codecs. This is a very special lead with advantages and disadvantages. And in 2018, we did in my hospital the first uh, European implantation of this uh, lead. Then we have the batteries, the neurostimulators. These can be rechargeables, like the one on the right part of the screen. You see it's a little bit smaller. And the non rechargeables on the left side of the screen. The non rechargeable is a little bit bigger. Why? If a patient gets a non rechargeable, neurostimulator, then the patient doesn't have to do anything, doesn't have to recharge it. But we have to change this neurostimulator every 12 to 18 months because the battery is empty. The rechargeable ones, there is a battery there, but you have to charge it like a mobile phone once to twice per week for one to two hours. This IPGs, these neuro, uh, neurostimulators, are staying in the body for 10 to 12 years. Then we have to change them as well. But you see the difference, uh, how big is a rechargeable one and how big is a non-rechargeable one. As with all therapies, we have indications for this therapy, we have contraindications for this therapy, and we have many gray zones. And the patients who are coming to the big academic hospitals, unfortunately, belong to these gray zones. These three photos were taken with the traffic lights green uh, orange and uh, red this is the university hospital of cologne my home here this was at 6 uh, 30 in the morning in the summer and in all countries and in germany as well we have some guidelines we have a german society of neuromodulation the same thing in all countries we have inclusion criteria meaning that we should provide this therapy in patients who already tried all other types of therapy, including drugs, physiotherapy, psychological therapy, and many other modalities. More important, exclusion criteria. We cannot implant such a system in patients with severe coagulopathies, 
bleeding uh, risk, with mental or psychiatric problems, addiction problems, secondary gains. For example, if the patient doesn't want to work, there are many patients that are coming to us and they are thinking that if they get such a system, then they don't have to work anymore in their lives and the insurance companies are going to pay for everything. Patients who are really old and they are not able to use the system, if they have an advanced tumor and, of course, infections in the area of implantation. The majority of patients who are coming to us are patients with back and leg pain, fell back surgery syndrome or persistent spinal pain syndrome. Why is that so? Because the failure rate of the lumbar spine surgery, what the colleagues are doing, the orthopedic surgeons or the general neurosurgeons, has a failure rate for this surgery of 10 to 46 percent. This is pretty high. And we also know there are corresponding publications which show that each time we keep operating on the spine of the patients, then the patients are not really satisfied. But we don't have patients, only patients with such problems. There are other patients with many other chronic pain conditions who could benefit from this therapy. For example, patients with intractable angina pectoris. Please don't get me wrong, all these patients have already tried all drugs and they are still taking them, nitrates, beta blockers and many, many other things. They all had stents. Most of them had bypasses, so they had tried everything. If they still have pain, then spinal cord stimulation is a super therapy for this. Patients, we plant a lid with the tip at C7 or T1, a little bit on the left side, and we can modulate the sympathetic system. It's really impressive. And one question uh, that uh, everybody asks is, if a patient with this system has a heart attack, will the patient notice it? Or will the spinal cord stimulation system cover this acute pain? And the answer is that spinal cord stimulation cannot cover the acute pain from heart attack. The patient will uh, notice it. And there are also corresponding publications. A second very good indication for peripheral vascular disease, for uh, spinal cord stimulation, sorry, is the peripheral vascular disease, if it's possible, according to Foden classification, stage 2B or 3, in some cases also stages 4. Here we plant a lead in the midline with a tip at T10. Why in the midline? Because if the patient has problems, let's say, in the left foot, it's a matter of time that new problems will come on the other side as well. As well. This is why we plant from the very beginning the lead in such a way so that we can cover both legs. On the right part of the screen, you can see what happens before starting the stimulation, control. You see the color of the foot, it is green. Green means that we don't have so much blood in this area. And you see in the bottom, 30 minutes after stimulation, the color is completely different, it's red. Red means that more blood is coming there, so the perfusion is better and the pain relief is also much better. If you are interested in the topic, this is a review article published in the British Journal of Neurosurgery. Uh, Dr. Simakidu is a resident, and I am, you know who I am. If you are interested in the topic, you can read it. If you don't really like reading articles on YouTube, you can find this interview about spinal cord stimulation and peripheral vascular disease. Guess what? I'm there as well. You can hear some things about the therapy. I think it's pretty interesting. It is only 30 minutes. We have also the option of a hybrid simulation. Hybrid simulation means that we can combine therapies. We can combine spinal cord stimulation and peripheral nerve feed simulation. This example, you see a man, he had an accident. You can see the scar. In the beginning, the colleagues implanted two subcutaneous leads, peripheral nerve field stimulation, parallel to the scar. You can see the two leads and the IPG, the neurostimulator. The patient was very satisfied, but some years later, he came back and told us, I benefit from the system, but my pain now is severe. What can you do? By this patient, we implanted one more lead, but this time epidurally in the spinal canal, spinal cord simulation. And now the patient has two systems, 
one spinal cord stimulation, one peripheral nerve field stimulation. There's another type of hyper stimulation. You can have a spinal cord stimulation system and a pump. Let's say a pump filled with morphine or with zaconotide, a non-opioid drug. You can combine these therapies as well. And we have many waveforms. I'm going to say some things later about this thing. The gold standard is the tonic stimulation, a stimulation with a tingling cessation. The patient always notices that the stimulation is working because the patient always has a tingling cessation. But nowadays we have also other types of stimulation without tingling. And the question, why is that so important or is it important? This is Alma. She comes from uh, UK, born in 2005. Some people think the next Mozart. She plays music, she composes. Some people say she's the next Mozart, but it is really impressive to see how she can take some notes, random notes, and combine them to produce a melody. If you cannot hear the sound, it doesn't make much sense, but this makes more sense. Alma says that it's not, it should not be something complex. The music that we are hearing should not be very complex. It should not be very serious, but actually people should like to listen and enjoy it. And this is the same thing for neuromodulation or spinal cord stimulation. Here is the definition of music according to the Merriam-Webster uh, dictionary, the science or art of ordering tones or sounds in succession, in combination and in temporal relationships to produce a composition having unity and continuity. We can say the same thing for spinal cord stimulation. It is the science of combining electrical signals in succession, in combination and in temporal relationships. The same is true also for the intratecal therapy. When we apply drugs in the spinal canal, you can use one drug or you can use two drugs or more of them. Also in combination in different temporal relationships. So it's like music. And once again, spinal cord simulation should not be something really complex. It could be something simple, but we should give these electrical signals to the brain and with these electrical signals, we should create a, mu a music for the brain, which is pleasant. Why is it important to have many waveforms, many different types of stimulation? Because different types of stimulation are acting or influencing different areas in the brain. So here is a work uh, presented at the NANS conference in 2000. 15 and you see that the sudden rate the tonic stimulation the tingling stimulation is uh, stimulating some specific brain regions a stimulation with one kilohertz is stimulating other brain regions a big question is if we need a trial i told you that we should implant the leads we should do a trial for one to four weeks and if the patients are satisfied we should connect the leads to the battery. Due to COVID, many colleagues in the United Kingdom mainly starting uh, asking if it's really useful to have a trial or necessary to have a trial, or we could do only one surgery, implant the leads and connect them to the neurostimulator at the same time in one surgery. There are some advantages and some disadvantages. And the colleagues from the United Kingdom also published many papers on this topic and actually showed that if you do in your center many spinal cord stimulation trials and you have more or less 85% success, so 85% of the patients are satisfied during the trial, then financially speaking, you could deploy from the very beginning a rechargeable neurostimulator without even doing a trial. Or if you are doing in your center spinal cord stimulation trials and 55% of the patients are satisfied, 
then in the future you don't have to do any trials anymore financially speaking once again you can implant a non-rechargeable ipg during the first operation leads plus plus ipg and why is there this difference 55 percent 85 percent because of the cost the rechargeable neurostimulators are much more expensive than the non-rechargeable ones and these are the financial aspects but there are some medical aspects as well who have less infections it makes sense it's different if you perform only one surgery it's difficult it's different if you perform two or more surgeries you have to do more punctures you have also productivity loss losses because the patient should uh sit at the hospital for many more days should not go to work and the main question is if these trials are really predictive of long-term outcomes one publication in pain a very good journal showed that these clinic trials have a sensitivity of 100 percent but a specificity of only eight percent and the authors conclude that although a trial may have some diagnostic utility it provides no patient outcome benefits but to be honest i would always do a trial for my patients because they are feeling more safe they need some time to get used to the stimulation to actually see in everyday life that it helps them and then implant the permanent battery but this is my personal point of view if you are interested in the topic you can uh, read uh, this uh, editorial in the internet journal of neurosurgery for free i hope it's not too boring for you let's move to the second point how we got to the new spinal cord stimulation systems once again the gold standard is the tonic stimulation tonic stimulation meaning the patient has tingling cessation you cannot hear the sound but you can see mr Pink here who is always playing the piano here or uh, and he always plays the same note all other colleagues in the orchestra are playing different things different notes he has to play always the same thing look at his finger and this is monotonous and maybe this monotonous repetition of electrical impulses in the context of spinal cord stimulation uh, is boring for the brain and the pain relief cannot be optimal or if we do have pain relief that uh, this pain relief does not last a long time so we don't want to have a brain like Mr. Bean, who is bored, we want to have a brain who is enjoying the melody of the electrical impulses. And this is a video, an animation showing the difference between the tonic stimulation and the high frequency stimulation, a stimulation with 10 kilohertz, 10,000 hertz, but there is sound and you cannot hear, so I don't think it makes sense to show it to you. What you should know, however, is that with this stimulation, this 10 kilohertz stimulation, we can influence or we can stimulate the dorsal horns, not the dorsal columns. Tonic stimulation acts on the dorsal columns. The 10 kilohertz stimulation acts on the dorsal horns. It is a subperception stimulation. Subperception means that the patients don't feel anything. They don't have a feel a tingling cessation but the therapy works one more subperception algorithm is this burst or best tr stimulation it's also subperception not tingling but here we have packets of high frequency pulses here we need much more energy than with tonic stimulation but it could act a little bit better why the tonic stimulation acts or influences the lateral pathway of, the, of pain the lateral pathway of pain is responsible only for the perception of pain burst stimulation and high frequency stimulation with 10 kilohertz are acting at the lateral pathway but they also influence the medial pathway the medial pathway of pain is implicated in the affective components of pain our emotional reaction to pain or our attention to pain. So both pathways are really 
important. We also have the possibility of combination therapy. And here there are some modifications. Let's say you have a patient with only back pain. You can apply at the same time a tonic stimulation and the subperception stimulation. So a tingle stimulation and a non-tingle stimulation for back pain, for the same pain area. Second scenario, you have a patient with back pain, but at the same time, the patient has leg pain. You can apply one waveform for back pain, another waveform for leg pain at the same time. And the third scenario, even if you can achieve a very good pain relief with only one pain waveform, maybe it makes sense to use multiple waveforms sequentially. Why? Because we think, we don't know that, we think and we hope that if we use different waveforms sequentially, then a big problem in the spinal cord stimulation therapy, which is called loss of efficacy over time or habituation, will not be there anymore. We know that 20 to 30% of the patients are coming back months or years after the implantation of the system. And although the system is working, they are reporting that their pain is pretty severe. Why? Because the brain gets used to this stimulation. And this is called loss of efficacy or habituation. If you are interested in a combination therapy, another editorial in the Internet Journal of Neurosurgery for free. I must do a little bit of promotion about my hospital. Here is the IPG, the neurostimulator, who can provide which can provide this combination therapy. We did the first European implantation in September 2018 in my hospital, the University Hospital of Cologne. We were very happy about it. And two years later, we did also for the first time in Europe the first implantation of an MRI compatible neurostimulator which can provide this combination therapy. Why is this important? We have from different companies different systems. We are trying to implant such systems which can provide different types of stimulation, but at the same time, these types of stimulation, these type of stimulators are MRI compatible. The patients can have an MRI control after the implantation of the system. Another technology from another company is this frequency pairing. Pairing means we can use different types of therapy, but not at the same time. It's not a combination therapy. It is a pairing therapy. For example, you can stimulate for some seconds with tonic stimulation, then with high frequency, and then once again with tonic stimulation. Or you can stimulate with high frequency for some seconds, then with burst stimulation for some seconds, and then once again with tonic stimulation. Pairing is one thing, combination therapy is another thing. A new technology is this closed loop. The article was published in Neuromodulation. This is the official journal of the International Neuromodulation Society with 3.7, I think, impact factors, so pretty good. It was published in 2017. And there you can find this uh, graphic showing the concept. With this therapy, we are planting one or two leads. The lead can stimulate can give electrical impulses. Because of the stimulation, we have the generation of ECAPs, evoked compound action potentials. The lead can measure these ECAPs, can compare the amplitude of the ECAPs with a preset point, and then can calculate a new stimulation current and generate new stimuli. And then we have a closed loop. Why is this important? Please have a look at the lower part of the image. Open loop stimulation. Open loop stimulation are the traditional spinal cord stimulation systems. Then please have a look at the black line. Black line is the stimulation. The goal is to keep this black line within the therapeutic window. If the line is above this window, we are giving much more uh, impulses than it's necessary. 
we have a hyperstimulation. If the black line is lower than the therapeutic window, then we don't stimulate appropriately. In both cases, the patient is not satisfied. And you can see that if the patient is studying or walking in place or being supine or coughing, all these things play a role for the stimulation. Let's move now to the upper part of the image. If we have a closed loop system, the stimulation, the black line, stays almost always within this therapeutic window. We don't have an overstimulation, we don't have a hyperstimulation. And it doesn't matter if the patient is studying or sitting or coughing or walking in place, the stimulation always stays within this therapeutic window. An animation showing this concept, two leads there, we stimulate. Because of the stimulation, you have this E cup, the red line, the lead measures this red line, this E cup, and can uh, modify the stimulation. If you read a neurophysiology book, you will see this image on the right part with two positive ways. It has to do with uh, sodium and calcium channels and one negative one. But in the operating room, you see this image. This is a real life E cup. Why is this important? Because the E cups occur as a result of the stimulation. So they are a real time objective measure of spinal cord response. And we do need objective measures in pain management. There are many studies with this closed loop stimulation with a follow up period of up to two years. What's really impressive is that if you see at the last column, after two years, 80% of the patients have more than 50% pain relief. 46% of the patients have more than 80% pain relief. In the literature, more than 80% is called high responders or profound responders. So it's really a big deal to have a pain relief of more than 80%, okay? You can see that 95% of the time, the stimulation remains within the therapeutic window. And for me, what's really important, 67% of the patients eliminated or reduced the opioid intake. Maybe in Europe, this is not a huge problem, but in other countries like the United States, this opioid pandemic is, or epidemic, is a huge problem. And if we can show that our therapies, our spinal cord stimulation therapy, can achieve such an opioid elimination is a really big deal. Another algorithm, TTM, differential target multiplex. Here we have multiple signals which modulate the activity not only of neurons but also of glial cells. And why is this important? Because the glial cells are involved in neuroinflammation but also in amplification, modulation, and distortion of sensory signals. And we also know that these cells outnumber neurons in the spinal cord and the ratio is 12 to 1, so they have to be important. There are publications with animals which show that this algorithm can provide a better pain relief as compared to tonic stimulation and high frequency. There are also publications with humans which show that back pain and leg pain are much less with this algorithm. This is how we implant the leads. We implant two leads, one with the tip T8, the second in the middle of T9. We have four programs, one basic program with 50 hertz. We have three prime programs with 300 hertz. The newest thing in the market, market is this fast waveform, fast acting subperception therapy. It's an acronym. Here we simulate with 90 hertz, but it is sub-perception. The patient does not have a tingling. And the new thing here is that the pain relief comes within seconds or minutes. So you have two good things here. The first one, that the patient does not have to tolerate a tingling cessation. And the second good thing is that the pain relief is coming really, really fast. This is an animation showing the mechanism of this waveform, which is called subtle intuition. You cannot hear the video of this only my voice, but 
I can describe it a little bit. When we are using the tonic stimulation, we can stimulate the alpha beta fibers, which are coming from the center of the pain area, but also from the periphery of the pain area. If we stimulate all these alpha beta fibers from the center and from the periphery, we have a pain relief, but not an optimal one, because if you stimulate the fibers from the center, you also have some pain as well. You stimulate this wide dynamic range neurons, which are responsible for pain in the dorsal horns. So at the same time, you offer pain relief, but also an increased pain as well. The goal with this new algorithm is to stimulate only the surrounding fibers, the fibers which are around the pain area. If you stimulate only the surrounding fibers, then you can offer the patient the pain relief without stimulating the wide dynamic range neurons at all. It seems a little bit complicated. I have to see this presentation more than 10 times to understand it, but I will try to explain it in another way. Let's say you have an accident with your hand. You hit it somewhere against the door, for example. Which is your first reaction? when something like that happens. You rub your hand, but you are not rubbing your hand exactly at the place where we have the pain. Then it would be really painful. You are rubbing your hand near the pain area, in the surround area of the pain area, and you have a pain relief. This is not a coincidence. You are activating by rubbing the alpha beta fibers, which are in the surround area of the pain area. I don't know if you understood it. It's a little bit complicated, but as a theory, it's super. I can tell you, I tried it with many patients. When it works, it works super good. The patients are really crying because of joy, not of pain. But it doesn't work in all patients, and we don't know why. This was the first publication, clinical publication, with this waveform, which uh, showed uh, a remarkable pain relief, 86% after six months. And the results are the same after one year as well. The authors here commented on the spin of this waveform, how fast this waveform can provide pain relief, and they found it was within 11 uh, minutes. And what's really important is the energy usage. If you stimulate with high frequency, 10 kHz, for example, you need much energy. If you stimulate with 90 Hz, you see the amount of energy you need, this charge per second, millicoulombs per second, is much, much less. 90 hertz on the lower part of the graph, you see the energy users is really low. If you go up to 10,000 hertz, you see the energy users is much, much more. We don't do any experiments. We do have clinical data which show why this therapy is effective. We have basic science publication. We have case studies, case reports. We have retrospective studies. We have prospective studies and we have the randomized controlled trials, which are actually the best study. So we do have evidence. There are many studies out there for many companies. These are studies only from one company. But I am showing this just to underline the fact that what we are doing in the hospitals is not pure luck or we don't experiment with our patients. There are studies which showed that the therapy actually works. And to take one step further, we know it works, we want to optimize it. And optimize it means we have to find the right frequency. And with this frequency, the patient should have a substantial pain relief, but at the same time, we should not have a very big energy demand. And this was a very famous study, PROCO study. The colleagues tried to see if it makes a difference, if we stimulate with 10 kilohertz, with 7 kilohertz, with 4 kilohertz, or with 1 kilohertz. And they found that actually it doesn't make a difference. So if it doesn't make any difference, then it's better to use the 1 kilohertz frequency, less frequency, because the energy demand is much lower. Then the colleagues took it one step further and said, OK, let's see what happens now if we reduce the frequency even more. So we've started with one kilohertz, 1,000 hertz. Then 
the exam in what happened with 600, 400, 200, 100, 50, and 10 hertz. And you see in the middle part of the slide that actually the pain relief was pretty much the same, better with 200 hertz. And they said, okay, then let's stimulate with 200 hertz. Why? Because the pain relief is optimal and the energy demand is not that high. I hope you are still with me and you are not sleeping. You don't have to read all these slides. I just want to tell you, it is a publication from my hospital here. I'm involved in this publication. It was about patients who already have a spinal cord stimulation system, but some years later, they came back with loss of efficacy or habituation. The system was working, but they were not satisfied. What did we do by these patients? We externalized the leads. So we disconnected the leads from the neurostimulator. We connect these leads to extensions and we try it with different types of stimulation and with combination of different types of stimulation. And we saw that it was 37 patients, 29 responded well. And out of these 29 patients, after one year, we have a pain relief of 43%. So we are speaking about patients who were not satisfied. They were ready to have their system expanded and we could save the system and not only save it but we can achieve a substantial pain relief hopefully you're still with me we are very optimistic about this therapy because we are aware now that we do have a distinct mechanism of action we have different waveforms that are acting in different areas and we can combine all these things so we have specific special software for example this illumina 3d is coming from a specific company a tonic stimulation which works at the dorsal column but this tonic stimulation does not offer only inhibition of pain but also an excitation so we have a combination of excitation and inhibition this is why the results are not optimal we have an inhibition mechanism this is a stimulation at the level of the dorsal horn. We make a broad field over the dorsal horns and we block the neurons in the dorsal horn. And we have the new waveform, this fast. The mechanism of action is called surround inhibition, which acts also at the dorsal uh, columns with 90 hertz. And now we can stimulate or activate only these fibers which are responsible for pain relief without causing any extra pain all these things are good but in the end we must ask the patient if he or she is satisfied and the best measure is this osvest disability index we have to see what the patients can do in their everyday life or with other words their functional status there are many randomized controlled trials from different companies, you see here three different companies, and all of them are showing that the patients have much more disability after the implantation of the system. And this patient global impression of change or patient satisfaction, these are four studies, two with one company and the other two with two other companies, which show that the vast majority of the patients are satisfied with this therapy. Before all these waveforms, when we had only the tonic stimulation, the tingling stimulation, we had some algorithms. And then it was important to know if you have leg pain or back pain, and if the back pain was local or diffuse, and then try to choose between peripheral nerve stimulation or spinal cord stimulation with one or two leads. This is an old algorithm. We don't use it anymore because the results with spinal cord stimulation and all these new waveforms are much, much better. And the future, what brings the future? We need more data. All companies are working on this topic. They have many apps. These apps are collecting data. For example, how many kilometers or meters walks a patient every day, heart rate, breathing rate, how many hours the patient is sleeping, and many, many other things. And they try using all this data to find which algorithms would be the best for its specific disease. 
of course artificial intelligence helps us a lot with all this data artificial intelligence was used to complete the 10th symphony of beethoven he died before completing it so the musicians using the other works of beethoven plus artificial intelligence could uh, complete it and they presented it in Bonn here in Germany in October uh, last uh, year. So artificial intelligence can be used for music but can be used also for pain treatment in order to optimize our results. Another technology we are using is this merged reality. We are blending to real-time video streams. For example, I'm here in Cologne. I'm trying to program a patient. I cannot do it. I need the help from a technician. My technician is in Greece. Maybe he lies in a bit there. He can see what I see on my laptop. And he can show me on my phone what I should do, what I should press. And this is really helpful, especially in COVID times. We have also the option of remote programming. This is a special software, Heart Connect. It was first used uh, by cardiologists, but we can use it also in the interventional pain management. I am in my office, I have a technician in the room of the patient, with the patient, and I have a second technician somewhere else, for example in Greece. And we can all work together at the same time. It works. There are also some more exotic uh, indications for spinal cord stimulation. We can influence the respiratory function, we can implant leads at T2 to T5 in patients with complete spinal cord injury. Why? Because we want to reduce the time on mechanical ventilation and we want to reduce the related complications because mechanical ventilation is not a good thing. And this is a newly published article in respiratory physiology and neurobiology. I'm also involved there. It's really interesting. And maybe new indications for fast for this new waveform are patients with mixed pain. Mixed pain means that the patient has a combination of neuropathic pain and nociceptive pain. Till now, we knew that spinal cord stimulation is a very good therapy for patients with neuropathic pain. Till now, we said that patients with nociceptive pain are no candidates for spinal cord stimulation. Now we see that with a combination of these waveforms or with the new waveforms, we can treat patients with mixed pain. Of course, the majority of them have both neuropathic and nociceptive pain, and the neuropathic component is a little bit higher. These are patients from my department, only 14. They were presented in the European Congress uh, in September last year, and uh, yesterday I just got an email that it was accepted for publication as well in a very good journal, Interventional Pain in Medicine, which shows that after six months, the pain relief is substantial. So. Uh, 12 out of these 14 patients hit a NRS score, a pain score of 2. So for, on this scale from 0 to 10, they started with 8.3 and after 6 months they were uh, of, at uh, 1.4. So it's pretty good. But what's even more interesting is that the disability is much less. So the functional status of the patients is improving. And even more interestingly, the quality of life is improving dramatically. And this is our goal. It's not about pain scores. Pain scores are irrelevant. Our goal is to make our patients functional. Our goal is to offer a better quality of life. This is a photo from Ikaria, the small island in uh, Greece. Pain relief is more important than waveforms. It's like uh, what uh, Alma said with the melodies. It's not about complex uh, melodies. You have to find something that really works. It can be complicated, it can be simple. For example, on this highlight, I found these cars using for fire, for fires, they are still working, they are old, but they are still working, they are doing their job. It's the same thing. In some patients, we can use only tonic stimulation. The patients are satisfied. New indications, a newly published article from Dr. Slavin, patients after anevrismal subarachnoid hemorrhage, Within three days of the anevrism rupture, the colic implanted leads in the cervical area and they stimulate it with tonic stimulation, 60 hertz, for uh, 10 days to two weeks. And they found that the 
perfusion in the brain was much better. You know, sometimes as physicians or as physicians, we're a little bit arrogant. We think we can help uh, all patients, we can uh, relieve the pain, but chronic pain is uh, really tough. In some cases, we cannot uh, treat it, so we shouldn't be so arrogant. I found this on Instagram. It's about emails. We frequently forget to attach the files we want to send, but this applies to the chronic pain patients as well. We have patients with chronic pain patients. We implant something. We are sure we are helping the patients, but sometime later, the patients are coming back and they are not satisfied. Why? Because we have not treated the emotional and cognitive aspects of pain. It's not only about electrical impulses, it's about psychology as well. A very good and interesting publication in the European Journal of Pain, and based on this publication, colleagues constructed this website, this e-health tool. You can see the link. You can register for free. And there are some questions there. You should give the clinical characteristics of your patients and the psychological ones. And the system will make a recommendation if the patient is a good or a bad candidate for spinal cord stimulation. This uh, system was thought to be useful for general practitioners or neurologists in order to increase the referrals. And it works. It's really interesting. You should try it. So, once again, the goal is to keep evolving. Benjamin uh, wrote either write something worth reading or do something worth writing. Spinal cord stimulation and neuromodulation as a whole is really something worth doing. Not to forget, technology is good, but we also need compassion because compassion is the antitoxin of the soul. Compassion for our patients, but also compassion for physicians as well. This is one of our publications I'm involved here as well, published this year in uh, the Chirurgy, a German journal. You see the abstract also in uh, English. It was about a burnout and addiction of medical personnel during the COVID uh, pandemic. It's a really interesting article. It, it makes us think that <laughs> compassion is something good, but not only for patients, for us as well. In interventional pain management, we urgently need collaboration, a national collaboration, an international collaboration. We all speak together from different disciplines. We need good technicians, these are all technicians that are helping me to program my patients to have really good results and I'm very grateful for their help. These are the social media accounts of the Journal of Neuromodulation, the official journal of the International Neuromodulation Society, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. You can follow this. If you are interested in the field, these are two books where I am involved, Hardware of Neuromodulation and Recent Developments. If you have any questions now, please feel free to ask them. If you don't want to ask them now, this is my email address. You can always send me an email and I will try to get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. Thank you. Thank you very much for such an informative lecture. Professor, I 